I just passed my part 107 test with a 97 after just three days of study on completely free materials. And I wanted to share what I learned in case it's useful to you. So today I've got another hobby episode, this time in the world of drones. See, I recently bought a Mavic Air 2 and was hoping to do some basic things like be able to take some pictures and videos uh, for my YouTube channel and even just be able to provide free services for some local organizations. Uh, including a nonprofit where I actually serve on the board of directors. I quickly found that even indirect value is considered receiving goodwill as payment, and uh, my work would be considered illegal, subject to a $100,000 fine, and quickly prevent any valuable use of this drone. So I scheduled my small unmanned aircraft systems exam uh, so that I could fly uh, with that Part 107 remote license. And I took the exam just a couple days after some new laws went into place. And I was surprised to see that actually several of the questions on the exam already had these new laws. I assume if you're watching this, you're thinking about taking the exam. I know a lot of people promote classes that you can take online uh, for a few hundred dollars, but after just a few days of study with completely free content, I was able to pass with a 97. So I wanted to share what I learned, uh, how I studied, and what you should know about some of the important April 2021 updates before you take your test. Be sure to check out the links in the description because I'll reference a lot of content um, and include all those links there for, uh, for your study. So I took my test on April 23rd, two days after the laws went into effect, and I almost didn't even study for these questions. I thought it was very unlikely that they would play any real role on the test, maybe a question or two if it had been updated. Um, so I didn't even study those until the last minute, and I'm very glad that I did. Overall, I put in about 10 to 12 hours of study, including on my lunch breaks uh, and a couple of hours each night, just leading up to the test for those few days. And the first step um, led me down the path of probably the most famous video on this topic, which is Tony Northrup's study guide. Uh, it's a couple hours long. Overall, I think I watched it maybe three times. Uh, hopefully, if you're like me, you can also speed up these videos though each time so that um, it's a little bit more engaging, uh, especially as you're going through the same content over and over. Uh, then I took a practice test and got an idea of what I was retaining well and what I wasn't. Uh, and after that, I watched another video from Better B-Roll, and I took some notes on everything that, um, that I didn't already know that wasn't obvious to me um, from going through uh, those first videos. I then took another practice test, uh, and again, focus each time more on what am I still not getting, what am I unfamiliar with, uh, what are the parts that are uh, making me have to think a little bit more than the others? So those videos and tests will get you familiar with the main areas that are still on the test, including things like how to read the METAR and TAF reports, how to read and understand all the sectional map questions, MOA, military zone knowledge, um, radio frequency, uh, all the different questions like that. And again, especially that uh, sectional chart data. Those videos will get you through probably 75% of the test, uh, even if you learn that content inside and out. So again, really become familiar with that content. That was basically my foundational material uh, that I got to know extremely well. But then to build on that, I also watched some videos like this, um, some more recent and updated things, just trying to capture anything that people didn't mention, um, especially given that those videos are uh, were made about three or four years ago now. To be honest, many of the videos mentioned things that uh, I didn't, that they didn't recall going over in those videos, but the, the information was definitely in there. Um, so watch those videos thoroughly because a lot of people seem to miss the, um, that content even after they watch it a couple times. But some of the stuff was either entirely new or at least somewhat unexpected. And after all that, I skimmed through the original study guide on the day of the exam. Uh, you could buy the official updated study guide that's available for like 20 bucks on Amazon. Uh, or again, you could even pay hundreds of dollars um, to go through some of the online training classes. And a lot of those do have a money back guarantee that you'll pass. Uh, but I ended up spending no money whatsoever and passing other than the $160 to take the test um, and ended up getting the 97. So it's probably not necessary to go that route. And I'm not entirely sure if it'll even save you any time or um or even help improve your score on the test. The new information that you'll need to study uh, that's tougher to find is about the new rules for things like night flying, um, operations over people. Uh, both of those things used to require waivers and now do not um, under certain conditions, uh, as well as remote IDs. 
These rules went into effect on April 21st of 2021. One question that I had was basically about operating at night and asked about what the lighting condition should be for the operations location, so where you're actually piloting the drone from. I didn't see or hear uh, of anybody covering this, but uh, I was able to reason through on the test that it should be as dark as possible so that the drone pilot can see. Another question asked about intense lighting in the area where the drone will be flown. And the answer was that it should be turned off before and during the flight. Again, just think logically through this, uh, that any bright lights will make it difficult to see the drone and so would probably be considered unsafe. One question that I got about remote ID requirements was uh, where you would be able to solely fly without remote ID. Uh, and again, this one was something that I found on some of the more recent videos. Uh, the answer was that it's only in an FAA recognized identification area or a FRIA. Uh, so don't miss that either if you see it on the test now. Two other remote ID questions had to do with ADSB. Uh, that's the manned aircraft alert technology that some drones will use uh, to let you know where manned aircraft are located. Uh, basically, the same thing that you need to know is that these two should never go together. So ADSB. Uh, is still used for manned aircraft only and will not have anything to do with remote ID. Basically, drones should never transmit ADSB signals under any circumstance. One of the two questions I missed was an easy one. Um, it was asking about how often you need to register and renew your drone. Um, I put 24 months confusing it with the license process, uh, but the correct answer was three years. The other question I believe I missed was about center of gravity. Uh, it asks about when moving the center of gravity to the aft or rear section of the aircraft, how would it impact performance? Uh, the options were at all speeds, high speed only, or slow only, and I put all speeds. I believe the correct answer might have been uh, at low speeds only because uh, the only information that, uh, that I could find on it talked about it forcing the aircraft to higher speed. Uh, but again, I actually don't know the answer to this one for sure, so... Um, and the fact that drones are omnidirectional, I'm really not too concerned about it. One tricky question regarding sectional charts asked about whether or not inspecting a tower at max altitude um, above that tower would go into class B airspace. So again, you think about uh, a tower uh, where it's located, you're allowed an additional 400 feet over that obstacle. Um, the thing that made it challenging is that uh, the tower height was in AGL above ground level. Um, and you needed to be able to convert that uh, that total into the um, uh, MSL or uh, mean sea level uh, so that you understood that you were actually in class B airspace. If you didn't do that conversion properly in your head, um, then you would get that question wrong. So I was glad to see an exact question also that came from one of those more recent videos I just happened to stumble across where it asked about a remark on a METAR report. Um, and it asks, what does RAB 35 indicate on this report? The answer was that it began to rain, is the meaning, 35 minutes after the hour. Uh, and in this case, 1835 Zulu. Many number questions were also on there, uh, such as uh, knowing that you need to stay, how far away you need to stay from clouds. So again, that's uh, 2,000 feet horizontally and 500 feet below the cloud ceiling. And that question was also on the test, asking to define the cloud ceiling. Um, and the answer was that it is basically the lowest layer of unbroken clouds or the lowest visible obstruction in the sky. The PAVE checklist was also mentioned on the test in response to a question about ways to mitigate risk in the operation. So be sure to go over that too. I didn't really see uh, that in most of the videos or a lot of operation stuff, but the study guide does have more information on those operation questions. So be sure to check out the study guide at some point. Another question I hadn't seen but was able to measure out on the chart was what is the radius of class C airspace? The answer was 10 nautical miles. Um, but again, I hadn't seen that one prior. Maybe I just missed it like the others, um, but I was able to measure that out. Another thing that nobody says regarding the measurements um, but can be very helpful is to make sure that you uh, use your paper or whatever you, um, you're supplied with when you take the test. Uh, to go ahead and mark those measurements out quickly so that you have um, effectively a ruler that you can use to uh, measure those distances on the maps. It's very helpful. Um, sometimes I'll mention something being four nautical miles, um, and it's really helpful to very quickly be able to see which tower they're talking about. 
Hopefully this is a helpful update. If you're looking to take the part 107 test, I know there's a lot of great content out there already, so I'm not looking to restate everything or reinvent the wheel, uh, but hopefully this will serve as a helpful supplement to you um, with your other training materials as you look to pass uh, your part 107 test and get your remote license. Thanks.